You're listening to the Teach Better Talk podcast featuring expert educators eager to share progressive tactics to reach more students. Teach Better Talk is created by teachers and fueled by passion. Let's get started. episode 217 of Teach Better Talk. My name is Ray Hewart, and as always, I am with my pizza-making friend, Jeff Gargas. What? I was what, meant I to ask you, Jeff. I'm so you, confused right now. Can you make pizza? I have a, I have a serious question. I know we're going to get into this episode, but can you make pizza? Like me? Can I? Yeah. Like, if I handed you a frozen pizza, could you make it? Yes. Okay, so here's my question to you. Can you go through the steps really quick on making a frozen pizza? Just like super fast, like give me the basic. Open uh, open the thing, right? Open I got the box, you. yep. Mm-hmm. Usually it's sometimes in like some sort of like uh, wrap, so you got to take it out of that. Yep. Depending on how it's set up, I usually would put it on maybe like some parchment paper on a tray and then put it in the oven. Of course, you have to preheat the oven first. Wait, 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 wait. He went past the part I was trying to get to. Oh, so I'm sorry. So you take it out of so the cellophane out. thingy. Yes. And, and, then I, with- and then I get a tray, like a cookie sheet. I put it on a cookie sheet. So you're saying you, you, some- knew, you knew that the cardboard couldn't go in the oven. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Why? <laughs> my sister and I were having this debate this weekend, and then we phoned in my mother because neither my sister or I – knew that you shouldn't have the cardboard. I know that sounds stupid saying it out loud, but it's like if you take it off the cardboard, then it then it's like the pizza could fall apart. So I was like, no, you put the cardboard in the oven and you cook it for like 13 minutes. It's not going to be that bad. And then my mother was like mortified that my sister and I didn't know this. And my my blame is my mother never made frozen pizza, so it's her fault that there I- are There are some that you can actually just put right on the rack based on... But they have like a they're they're made they're strong they have a stronger crust. I don't know that there's any that come with anything that you can put in oven. Although I wouldn't be surprised you if they like made something that you could. But it's already no, I, on there. You should just take the plastic off, tape the paper off, and you should be able to put whatever it's on in the oven. Hey, maybe I'll try that next time. No, no, no. I I've on- heard you're not supposed to. I googled it, and there's a lot of fire stories. <laughs> yeah, don't I do wouldn't it. do it. Um, yeah, no, I put mine on a tray. And, okay. and we well, actually put ours on. Well, we actually put parchment paper down first because my wife doesn't want our cookie trays to be used. So, like, they get <laughs> protected first. Um, so, my sister and, and then, I. And then, well, hold on. I'm not done. Oh, I'm When sorry. I pull them out of the oven, I have to pull them off the tray to cut them because I don't want to get any marks on the tray or anything like that. So. Oh, wow. This is. I'm going to call Amy it's, after this podcast recording. <laughs> It's a it's a dictatorship here. I'm telling you, it, I, which is I hilarious if you know my wife. By the way, I mean, yeah, she's obviously. like the nicest, easiest. So so did you? Person. So you didn't actually cook a pizza this way. You didn't do that. Oh oh, I did cook a pizza, but I had these you know really long conversations first, so I did it the right way. Okay. I um, simply took the pizza out and threw it in the oven with nothing, and it just worked. So yeah, it didn't go through. It didn't it's go good. through. Is there a, a risk that it would gone through? I didn't even some think of just, that. Some of, just, some of the cheaper ones just aren't as good. They, they, they'll they like melt through if you don't do it right, if you don't have it preheated enough so it doesn't cook the, the crust the right way and stuff. So so you and your sister were having this conversation about putting – okay, and, and this is you. So bachelor's degree, master's degree. This is your <laughs> sister who I'm pretty sure is like a doctor at this point, right? Yeah, she is. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Um, sounds so like it was Jeff, well worth the trip around the world to get her doctorate. Yeah, um, thank you for going through this. I'm really glad that you knew because now I'm going to text her and give her another layer to the story that like we'll jump. Can you make sure you. that your that your mom knows that I knew because I, I need as any points anytime I can get your mom to like say good job Jeff or give me credit that's always plus because I mom's will awesome. I will actually let hi her Julie. Know. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Is that uh, all right? Um. I don't know why we're still recording, but we are. So here we are. Um, well, in so case hungry, our listeners didn't know how to make a that, frozen pizza. You know what? Let's listen. If this, if you just now, if you were today years old when you found out that you shouldn't do that, tweet at us. Or hey, better yet, try it. Put the pizza in with the cardboard, and then you know, 
tweet at us no, with a picture no. of the fire. No cardboard. Guys, that's uh, the rule, the, the moral of the story. Take the cardboard <laughs> To clarify, off. we do not atone or recommend putting any cardboard or other flame in happen. the oven. Um, curious. Just just to clarify, I want to make sure I want to see where we're at on, on, on all this. Um, putting things like spoons and forks, knives, other utensils in the microwave. Yes or no? Like, which way do you go on that? Okay, I'm not even answering. That's a dumb question, Jeff Gargas. Let's move on here. Here's What's what I want to talk about. <laughs> Here's what I want to talk about. <laughs> she doesn't want to answer. <laughs> I don't want to answer because it matters. Oh, my God. I can't even have this conversation with you. You stress me out, Jeff Gargas. Here's the deal, friends. I am learning to cook, and there might be some things that I'm still learning. But Jeff Gargas, what's the moral? He's a jerk, right? Let's just go with that. He's a jerk. He's a jerk. He's a jerk. Look, I'm not 100% sure where you're at on the answer. So I'm going to say, Ray, don't put utensils like that in the microwave. I know that. Just No, no, you get off. She's like, well, let's see what happens. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Jeff. (laughs) No, I know. And by the way, guys, I make a mean bag of popcorn. Like, oh, man, am I a popcorn? Ooh. So good. Well, but do you take it out of the bag before you put it in the oven, or? <laughs> Obviously, you guys oh, take the cellophane off, and then you put the. the- <laughs> you just dump the kernels on the bottom of the oven and turn them no. on. It's great. No, I'm great at popcorn. All right, let's move on. We actually had something we wanted to talk about before we get into this episode, but you derailed us. Let me just tell you, Jeff. You uh, derailed I, us. I did not bring up the pizza, um. So. I have another anyway. funny comment about pizza, but I'll wait. I just just yeah, so you know, later. you brought pizza. I've actually I'm four three days into now. I'm doing seventy five days no pizza to try and cut pizza out of my life because I realize that when I eat pizza, it messes with my stomach, and also when I eat pizza, I can't control myself. I eat too much every single time because I love it. So I'm cutting it out. I'm not going to eat pizza anymore. I just want to clarify. I could do that so easily. I never eat pizza ever. Like oh, I think my, the pizza I had le- yesterday or this weekend was like the first pizza I've had in like a year. Like I never my, eat pizza. My kids ask for pizza like every other day, and so every like three or four days we usually give in and get it because my wife and I both like it. And the kids eat it well, so I'm like, there's four of us, two that are that that eat a half piece of pizza. I should get two larges, right? Like that's a problem. And just pound six pieces of pizza. Yeah, it's a I problem. I do want to confirm, why I'm doing though. 75 days because I'm at like 300 and something days with no fried foods at this point. So, and no French fries doesn't count. Yeah, French fries. Thanks. I have such an issue with so many things you just said. But, right. <laughs> um, anywho, there's so many things. I just want to confirm, though. I would have pizza with your family anytime they wanted. So, if, if that offer still so stands, if they're like, want to like trade me in, like put me in, coach, like let me know. I'm in. Uh, I do it. I just don't think Chris would appreciate me showing up to teach a classroom. But, you know, we'll see what happens. Oh, Chris, my principal. Yeah, he wouldn't. That's true. Especially since we're remote. It would be like, who's this weird guy on our Zoom call? It'd be weird. Well, I don't know. You know, Chris, Chris, if you're listening, uh, tweet at me. Let me know. Would you be okay with me? Actually, anyone who's listening, would you be okay if I swapped in and took care of your classroom for, for a few days? Like, let me know. Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll do it. No. Moving on, I want to talk about Mastery Chat really quick because, Jeff, so many people have been asking me about remote learning resources. I've been, I literally have two messages right now in my Twitter DMs of people who've messaged me within the past hour. Like, essentially, I'm going to like totally generalize, but they're like, hey, Ray, what's your favorite remote learning tool? And I have had to like share a number of things. I've had some great conversations and wonderful, but I want to make sure all of our listeners know that Mastery Chat is a good place to like, go and ask these questions to not only me, but like a way wider audience and collect those resources. So do you mind giving like a synopsis of like when Mastery Chat, what is it, all that stuff? Yeah. So you can find everything at teachbetter.com slash Mastery Chat um, or every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Eastern time on Twitter. It's Mastery Chat. So if you're not familiar with this, I'll give you the really quick version here of what a Twitter chat is. Essentially, Twitter chat is just an agreed upon time where a bunch of people are going to connect on Twitter like around a hashtag, right? So we do it on Thursday nights, 8 p.m. It goes for an hour. You're going to go on there. You're going to search hashtag mastery chat. You want to click latest, and it's going to give you a feed of every time someone's using the hashtag mastery chat. We have moderators who are awesome to come up with questions. We do usually six, sometimes seven questions throughout that hour. They're going to post it out doing Q1 for question one, Q2, Q3, so on and so forth. 
And then if you want to participate, you're going to put A1 for answer to 1, A2, so on and so forth. Put whatever your thought is to the question that they pose and then make sure you put hashtag mastery chat somewhere in there when find it, right? So what, what that leads to is hundreds of, hundreds of educators from all over the world, by the way. We get like multiple continents rep uh, represented every week. Uh, and they're coming together and they're, they're, they're answering questions. They're, they're commenting. They're offering suggestions. They're getting, I love that you and I can both be in the chat and never like connect to see each other and have two very different experiences because you get kind of on these little side conversations and these other connections. It's a great place to connect and meet new educators. It's a great place to just, if you don't want to participate, you just want to kind of lurk and watch to just see a bunch of answers. And my favorite part is that it stays on Twitter. So it's not done when we're done. You can go back anytime, follow the hashtag and see all these different resources. And then what we do every Thursday night is right afterwards, around nine, a little after nine o'clock Eastern time as we go live all over our social media, typically with our guest moderator. And we talk a little more in depth about things. We usually, uh, I like like throw in a couple of their own questions at them, letting them answer live. We talk with uh, whoever's commenting and stuff. So like Ray said, it's a great place to connect. It's really this awesome like community, uh, like family feel of we're coming together we're trying to learn. It's it's a space for everyone. They're all trying to grow together, trying to be better together. Um, and I I think I love that community because there's a lot of grace too. So there's like no there's no question or answer that you should feel like nervous about or embarrassed about or anything like that. So it's a great place to just go like, hey, I need help with this, and you just get a pouring of 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 ideas and stuff. So great place to go, especially for right now for the remote learning stuff. So it's awesome, love it. So make sure if you're listening uh, that you come join us uh, any Thursday. It happens every single Thursday over at 8 o'clock Eastern on Twitter. 7 o'clock Central is, you know, the time that I like to refer to, but it's fine. Uh, and then, Jeff, uh, also, as you're thinking about participating in Mastery Chat and putting that into your calendar, you should also enjoy listening to this episode because that was an amazing segue. Great segue there. So this episode, uh, Deborah Barb joins us and... Uh, Deborah is actually someone who I actually was introduced through my amazing wife, Amy. Uh, so that means Deborah, because Deborah went to Hiram College, which is where I met my wife. Anyway, uh, Deborah is a teacher. Uh, she's also a yoga instructor. She, she talks about how she volunteers and, uh, she's just always looking. She's passionate about helping other people. That's just kind of where, kind of how it wraps it up there. Um, super fun, passionate, uh, educator, uh, actually here in Ohio, not too far from me. We had a great time just chatting to her about uh, what she's trying to do and how she's getting through this year. I think she this was a very like uh, real episode. When you listen to her, you'll be like, oh, I feel you, Deb. I'm with you. I'm right there with you. Um, and you're going to want to reach out to her and talk with her, I think, because she's someone that can put her arm around you, around you whether you know in person or virtually as, as it is now, and help you get through this year. So um, I really enjoy chatting with her. Ray, anything to add? I felt like there was at least, guys, at least three times I was writing down quotes she said. So get a notebook ready. That's all I'm saying. And which I completely forgot. Like, by the way, her her um, her advice to teachers was like such a cool connection. You got to listen to that. It's a really neat uh, connection piece there that was a lot of fun. So there's a little, little listen, a little, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A little let's learn about Jeff time in there too. A little fun, okay. little trip down memory lane, if you will. Anyway, great episode. Let's get into it. 217 with Deborah Barb. Hey, everyone. I am so glad that you're enjoying the episode so far. And I just want to give a quick shout out to all the speakers, a part of the Teach Better Speakers Network. Our speakers network is continuously growing to offer all of our network the most diverse lineup of educators humanly possible to serve your needs, whether it be in the classroom or just coaching your coaches. You can see the full list of the speakers, a part of the Teach Better Speakers Network at teachbetter.com slash speakers network. We so appreciate these amazing, ed amazing educators who continue to share their insights. And it's a great spot to head over to if you are looking to connect with, uh, with other educators and or bring someone in with your staff to motivate and talk about best practices. Head over to teachbetter.com slash speakers network for the full list. Let's get back to the episode. All right. We're here. We're going to chat with Deborah Barb and Deborah or Deb. We haven't decided whether we're going to call you Deborah or Deb or, or some other made up name yet, but we're having fun already. We're laughing already. Um, and that's always a good sign. So super excited to kind of dive in and get to know you more, learn more about your, 
your journey and your story and what you're all about. But before we get too far into things, how are you feeling right now? Um, I'm feeling a little stressed. I'm not going to lie. The the pressures of teaching in 2020 are are pretty intense, especially uh, in my district. So well, I'm sure it's like that everywhere. But um, yeah, just a little scattered and not not it's not a normal school year. That's for sure. Well, Deb, hopefully we like bring some positivity to your evening. I thought you were going to say you were stressed because we were interviewing you. I'm glad that that's not the cause. This can hopefully just be a fun time all together. Uh, before we get too far into all the things that to discuss, and trust me, guys, I have a list of things, questions for you, Deb, like so many things, especially since I know you're into yoga. So we'll get there. But <laughs> before awesome. we get into that stuff, would you mind kind of answering that age old question of what you do? Oh, man, um, that's that's a hard question. I do a lot. I really am just a, a pretty busy person. Uh, besides being a high school teacher, I also teach yoga. I used to coach basketball. I still play basketball in an old ladies league at my local YMCA. Um, try to help out wherever I can with, with little volunteer gigs and things like that. So I'm pretty involved in my community, but I guess the short answer is I'm a teacher. Um, so let's, Ray brought it up. So I'm going to bring it up for Ray. So you do teach yoga. Like how – it, it, do you, you have your own studio? Do you teach at a studio locally? Do you do on, on all online right now? Like how? What's what's that like? And what pointers could you give Ray? <laughs> I don't know. Ray's in the middle of a pretty intense challenge, so she's going to have to give us some pointers too. I no, think. guys, I'm nervous. I need like all the motivation and tips and tricks you've got for me. Just show up and try. That's all you got to do. That's it. Yoga's pretty good like that. I like that. That's a good yeah. show up and try. That's kind of that's kind of how I approach math class too. <laughs> that's our motto here at Teach Better Talk is just show up and try. Show up and try. That's the that's all you got to do. So that's <laughs> all right. So let's let's talk. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot on this podcast is is failure and the lessons learned from that. So can you share a story with us about a time that you've had a failure in your life? Kind of take a step with you. What happened? How did you overcome that? And then what did you take away from that experience? Wow. Uh, that's a big question. I really try to live my life in a way where I, where I don't have a lot of regrets. Um, and I, a lot of times walk away from situations maybe that other people would consider failures. And I kind of feel like if I can really take something away from that experience, learn a new skill, learn something about myself, um, then maybe it wasn't a failure after all. So I'd say the, the closest thing to a, a true failure that I had was um, I had started my second grad school program. So I was working on a master's degree and I got into my second semester and just life got kind of crazy. Um, and I just couldn't manage everything. I was teaching full time. I was coaching basketball. I you know, had a, a whole entire personal life with a lot going on and I just couldn't manage doing well at school. So I got to the point where I had a couple classes where I was sitting at the D range and I just couldn't accept that for myself. So instead, I completely withdrew from my program. Um, so it was a program that was mostly online. But in the summers, we did have face-to-face -face courses and we did research. Uh, so I was, I was invested. I had already done a summer trip and a summer program through this program. And I, I just walked away. So I really just quit. So I, I would say that's the, the biggest failure I've experienced. And it wasn't just because I didn't do so well, but I actually, I quit. Um, and I didn't get the credits. You know, I was in the middle of a, a pretty heavy semester and just walked away. So to me, that that was probably, like I said, the worst failure. But I bounced back. And, you know, about four years later, I ended up finishing that program. And I got my master's degree in biology from Miami University. So it was a learning experience. I learned a lot about just persevering. Uh, and really just thinking about ways to ways to stay positive. So I beat myself up a ton whenever I quit and it took a lot of a lot of personal work to kind of build myself back up and get myself to a place where I felt like I could go back to school. I could manage working as a teacher, I could manage doing that well and I could manage um, getting a meaningful master's degree. Not that there are any useless master's degrees out there, but uh, I wanted I I went to a program that was pretty challenging, 
And I said, it was just, it was a ton of work to get back to a point where I could, could bring myself to, to even reapply to get back in. Um, and then they just keep chipping away at some, at classes that I had already taken and walked away from. So it was a humbling experience to say the least. Yeah, definitely. And that, that, but that ability to look back at that and see, okay, you know, I had to, I had to take care of myself. I had to be able to, you know, forgive myself and stop beating myself up to go back and then to fight through that, you know, and like I said, the, the humility that it takes and the humbleness that it takes is, is really powerful then going in. So that's awesome to hear. So let's, let's flip it around now. Let's talk about a successful moment you had, and this could be something big or something small, but tell us what happened. Why was it a success for you? And then what'd you take away from that experience? Man. Um, my, my biggest, my greatest success as a teacher so far, uh, I, I really am just kind of recently experiencing. So I'll tell you about that. I teach a class called AVID. It stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. And I had a cohort of 18 students that I got to start working with when they were in 10th grade. And I got to continue working with that group of students every day during third period, uh, all the way to the point where schools were shut down last year. So the point of the program is really to help students prepare for whatever it is they want to do after high school uh, to be successful, whether they they go right into the the workforce, they go to a trade school, they go to a four-year college or the military. And a lot of these students are typically underserved, uh, minority populations, first-generation college students. Um, And so to take this group of students from 10th graders when I first met them, a lot of them are really doubting themselves. They, didn't, they kind of battled imposter syndrome quite a bit. I would recommend they take an honors course or they take an AP course and they just never really felt like they belonged. So to take a group of students like that and get all the way as close as we could have gotten in Ohio to graduation day um, and just know that every one of them had been accepted to a college and every one of them had applied for multiple scholarships. Uh, that was really powerful because I know that they may not have been able to say when they were graduating at the end of last school year, especially amidst all the COVID stuff. Uh, I don't know that too many of them without being a part of the program and without being in that class would have really gone through and followed through with plans for after high school. That's a huge success. I love that. It's a great story and extremely important work that you're doing with that group. You know, when it comes to every educator's time in, you know, like finding their niche, their passions in education, it really seems like there is always something that's fueling your fire, like keeping you excited, not only about education, but just the work that you're doing. What have you found to be that one thing for you, the thing that's really keeping you excited about the work you're doing? Man, I would probably say this AVID program, honestly. Um I was a student in high school that this program would have been perfect for me. Neither of my parents went to college. We were pretty low income. But, you know, I kind of had this thought in the back of my mind that I someday might, maybe I could be one of the people who go to college. Uh, And thankfully, I had some coaches around uh, to help me with that process. So I really just find a lot of passion in the population that we serve through the AVID program. Uh, I know that it's a program that has worked for a lot of students in our district. And now that I've graduated my cohort of AVID students. Uh, it gives me a little more time and flexi- excuse me, flexibility in my day and my schedule, uh, and even just the amount of energy I have now uh, to give back to the program in some different ways. So I really want to help the other teachers. There's a, a an AVID teacher for every grade. So right now we have uh, four AVID teachers at our high school. And it's just really nice and exciting to me to know that I can go back and help them now that I've already graduated a group. Um, and just be a part in some other ways of supporting not just the students, but also the teachers. Absolutely. So for if I'm listening right now, before we get to our next question, which always has to do with advice, I kind of want to ask a follow-up to this AVID program. If I'm listening right now as an educator, maybe I'm in a high school and I don't know if we have this program or I'm not in a high school, but I want to kind of look to see if I can recommend this program for um, schools in my area is this something that I can like Google search and find information about on? Do do I reach out to somebody? How can I maybe see if AVID is appropriate for, you know, my area? Yeah. So if you go to avid.org, that's the website that has all the information that anybody who's interested in the program would want to know about. It is a program that requires training for our 
school districts to be certified to teach this curriculum. So it's kind of an outside curriculum that individual school districts, or maybe even schools, I'm not sure, but uh, with us, it's at the district level, could adopt the curriculum um, and also have people within the district get trained to be able to teach the program. Awesome. Perfect. No, it's great Like for everybody to look into. I love that. Um, a question five always has to do with advice. You know, we're talking about all different teachers here. It could be really focused on those newer teachers, or we could look at any educator kind of like in our listening base. What type of advice would you suggest that, um, that an educator consider as they continue throughout their week and their career, uh, trying to serve students the best way possible? I think, I think my, my go-to advice in most situations where I'm seeking advice is usually because I'm second guessing myself. And I think especially for a lot of younger teachers who are getting into teaching right now, really any, any teacher who's, who's still working right now, we're doing it very differently. So I think fear is a pretty common emotion that a lot of newer teachers experience or even experienced teachers are going through right now, just with all the unknowns. Um, so I, my best advice is be afraid and do it anyway. So maybe you're not sure how a lesson's going to work out, or maybe you're not sure how your colleagues are going to receive an idea that you have. I think it's really important that people learn to sit with some fear a little bit and just go for go for it, go for it anyway. Okay, wait. I know we haven't gotten to the advice part of like the six questions, Jeff, but that right there, gold. Well, like, Brad, I don't know if you've connected that yet, but Deb, I don't like how how full circle that is for me to hear you say that. So you, I don't know if you know, some people listening might know this, but you know how Chad Ostrowski and I originally met was that I managed Chad's band when I had a record label called FTF Records. Most people knew or the way we publicized that we marketed it, the FTF stood for for the fans, as in for the fans of music. But where the name actually came from was from another, it was an internal message I always gave myself and FTF actually stood for feel the fear and do it anyway. <laughs> no way. Yeah. So I, Ray, I don't even know if you knew that, but like I, like that's, that's. Yeah, I, say, I don't like Jeff that you were like, well, our listeners might know. And then you say it and I'm like, I didn't even know that. Did our <laughs> listeners know that? If you're a listener, that, know that, raise that's your hand. what it comes from. So like literally I'm listening to her and I'm going, that's you, what? Like that was perfect. It was spot on. I was smiling ear to ear over here. Cause that's how I've always been too. Like this, this, this team teach better team was a prime example of that where I was, I was at a point where I was like, hey, like, I'm not going to do this business crazy thing anymore. And then I uh, felt that fear and just did it anyway. And here we are, right? You know? So, man, I am so behind that. Crazy. It's absolute gold. Uh, so I love that. So, all right, let's uh, let's keep it going. You're on fire right now. Um, <laughs> so we're going to go to the next six questions. Your goal is to answer each one in 15 seconds or less. Oh, boy. Bonus points for anything that you accidentally tie to Jeff's past life. <laughs> Uh, Challenge accepted. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, what is one ed tech tool you cannot live without? Uh, Google Drive runs everything. Uh, give us a book you're reading right now. <sighs> so embarrassing. I don't read books. I read uh, I read journals and articles and stuff. I go to JSTOR online for uh, periodicals. Uh, who do we need to follow on Twitter or Instagram today? You can give us up to three. All right, I would go with uh, the Focus Three or Tim Kite, uh, Edutopia, and then of course Avid for College Number Four in the middle. Is your go-to Twitter or Instagram or both? Or uh, I'm not a huge social media person, but Twitter for education stuff, Instagram for yoga stuff. Love it. Uh, what's a good YouTube channel or website or podcast for educators to check out? Uh, I would say for general education topics, Edutopia. Has some great stuff, including uh, some mindfulness tools and and just really progressive um, videos and ideas. Uh, Khan Academy or Headspace, I think those are important. Uh, give us a daily, weekly, or monthly routine every teacher should get into. Uh, press pause. Be present. I'm a big supporter of daily mindfulness and meditation practices, especially especially for teachers. Uh, and what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? From my dad, he said, 
make yourself useful, kid. Pretty much any time <laughs> I was around <laughs> being annoying. And uh, yeah, it turned out to be pretty good advice. I try to be useful. Oh my gosh, that is one of my favorite pieces of advice that has been shared. That's so awesome. They responded that way. That's actually really good advice. I feel like my my father told me that all the time too. I feel like all of us are like, huh, yeah, I guess I guess that is good advice. Yeah. When you think about it. It sounds different when you're hearing it when you're like nine (laughs) or eleven. I'm just saying. (laughs) But that's awesome. Make yourself useful. Oof. I love this. So Deb, I want to make sure our listeners can stay connected with you. I know you said you weren't huge into social media, but hey, like it's a great space to connect with new friends and stay up to date on the work they're doing. And I know that our listeners are going to want to do that with you. Would you mind kind of sharing how they can stay connected? Sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter at underscore Dbarb. Uh, Instagram at yogabledeb, Y-O-G-A for the yoga. Um, I guess I should spell the whole thing. Y-O-G-A-B-L-E-D-E-B. Uh, and I'm on Facebook as Deb Does Yoga. So a little, little heavy on the social media with the yoga stuff a little more so than the high school education stuff. But that's, that's where you can right. find me. Uh, you can know you can find all the links, all the resources, everything we talked about in this episode over at teachbetter.com, as well as those really important links for connecting with Deb and checking out the yoga and getting a little more connected, keep the conversation going with her. So head over to show notes over at teachbetter.com for all of that. Be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. And if you can give us a rating and review, we'd really appreciate that as well. And let's keep taking this one step further. Think of just three of your colleagues who need to hear these amazing stories and share this podcast with them. Deb, this was awesome. Uh, you did not disappoint. Super excited for people to listen to this. Um, excited to continue to be connected and learn and grow from you and with you. Just really appreciate you taking some time tonight and hanging out with us. Thank you. Absolutely. This was a good time. Yeah, thanks for cheering me up after a stressful day. Uh, we do what we can. That was our goal. It's <laughs> I succeeded, Ray. I'm pumped up about that. This is awesome. And until next time, let's get out there. Let's teach better. Mm-hmm.